as a flower farmer, I love the beauty of the flowers, but the thing that really matters is the money. And that is why today I'm going to talk about the 10 most profitable flowers here on the farm. Figuring out what is actually profitable is a little bit tricky. So these are a few of the things that I try to keep in mind when I do those calculations. The first one is how well does this flower sell? And that can mean two things. It can mean, can I sell a lot of this flower? And also, can I sell this flower for a lot of money? And two, how productive is it? How many stems of that flower can I get per square foot? And that is going to range hugely depending on what you're growing. I also consider days to harvest. And so what I mean by that is if it takes four months before I can finally go and cut those stems to sell, I do not get as many harvest days as I do on something that only takes two months and therefore I can get two full growth cycles out of it, out of that single space. And finally, how much does this flower cost me to grow? And that's broken down into three parts. The first is how much did the seed or the plant or the tuber cost? But there's also what was the labor hours? Was it a lot of work to get it to the point that I can harvest it? Is it something that needs to be tied up and staked and fussed and babied over? And then you also need to consider how much work does it take to harvest these? How much labor hours do I have to put in to actually pick these stems? Some things are wonderful, like sunflowers. I think every flower farmer will put sunflowers at the very top of their list because they're so easy. But I know you've all heard me gripe over and over again about how much I do not like harvesting cosmos. And that's because it takes a long time to pick those. It takes a lot of work for me. Now, because everyone is dealing with different growing conditions. My list of what is highly profitable for me is probably going to swing more to the drought tolerant flowers. And that isn't going to give you a very balanced list. So I've invited my friend Nicole from Flower Hill Farm to come and join me today so we can give you the best possible list of profitable flowers for your farm. Hi flower friends, my name is Nicole and I'm growing cut flowers in upstate New York zone 4B. Hold on a second, something doesn't feel right. <sighs> okay, I had to channel my inner Serena. I wanted to thank Ian and Serena for inviting me to take part in this video today. A little bit about myself. I am growing here in upstate New York. It's way up. When you think New York, you think New York City. I'm nowhere near New York City. I'm way up almost to Canada. So basically, I have 20 acres here. The name of my business is called Flower Hill Farm, and I have three outlets where I sell my flowers. I sell to a local florist. I also have a bouquet CSA. Now, if you don't know what a CSA is, it's a community supported agriculture where the members buy bouquets in advance. So I have members where I have a weekly pickup and a delivery system for my flowers. And perhaps my favorite way to sell my flowers is right here on the farm. I have a huge front porch, it wraps around the house, and I host bouquet bars where I have buckets of blooms out for sale. Certain hours, people will come and make their own bouquets and I sell them by the stem. And if people need help, they ask me and I'll go ahead and make a bouquet for them. It's just a really fun way to interact with the customers. And I'm so excited to be here sharing all that with you today. Sunflowers. Okay, so maybe this one is just a little bit obvious. Everyone loves sunflowers. So this past year, I grew six different varieties of sunflowers. I grew pro cut because they don't have pollen and that's something that you have to take into consideration when you're selling bouquets to customers. Do you want them to complain about the pollen that's dropping from the sunflowers? Because it's not just a little bit. Sunflowers have a lot of pollen. So the varieties that I grew were pro cut orange, pro cut plum, Pro cut, pro cut White Night and Pro Cut White Light. I also grew Red Hedge, which is just a fantastic, deep, deep maroon burgundy color. I loved it, my customers loved it. And then this next one blew my mind. I knew what the picture looked like. You know, you're looking through the seed catalogs and you see something and, you, and you're like, wow, that's awesome, I need it. I knew what the picture looked like. But once this double quick sunflower opened up in her glory, blew my mind. I was like, I need this, I need more of this, 
every day. And they were so fantastic that people were fighting over them at my bouquet bar. <laughs> like, can you make sure I get one of those double quick? So of course, next year, what did I do? I quadrupled my order for double quick sunflowers. So I'm absolutely excited about growing even more next year. So when it comes to selling the sunflowers, I sold them at my bouquet bar three for $5. And they were the first to go. Between that and the gladiolas, they were just a sellout every single time. Now, when it comes to profitability with sunflowers, they are the most expensive seed that you can buy for your farm in terms of quality. You know, you can buy a packet of snapdragons, a thousand of them for four or five dollars. Well, to get a thousand sunflower seeds, that's typically between 25 and 30 dollars wholesale. So the seeds are more expensive, but I do have to say almost every seed is gonna germinate for you. But you have to take into consideration critters because I lost a couple of hundred stems of my sunflowers from deer, gophers, whatever. They are um, magnets to squirrels and chipmunks too, which is why I do not direct seed my sunflowers. I'll start them inside and then put them out when they're a couple of weeks old because birds, chipmunks, squirrels, anything will get in there and start to eat your, your seeds and you don't want that. So in terms of profitability, you can purchase the $30 worth of sunflower seeds and make $1,500 off of that. And the best part about sunflowers, in my opinion, is that you put them in the ground and you're gonna have a sellable stem in 55 to 60 days. You can't beat that. If sunflowers are number one, then we have to put zinnias in as number two because they're very, very easy to make money on. They are the perfect cut flower because they are so easy to grow. You can plant them direct seed, they produce pretty quickly. Um, you can get a lot out of the space and they keep going and going and going. You can keep picking off of them all season long. And the colors, the range of colors that you can get on them and the range of styles, there's so many options. They also keep really well in the vase. They, you know, they have a nice long life. They're nice and sturdy and hardy. They're super easy for me carrying down to the farmer's market. And best of all, I find them really easy to sell. Zinnias are so important to us here on the farm. They're in pretty much everything that we make. The bouquets that we do, you know, the flowers that we sell, we wouldn't be able to do that without zinnias. They're one of the earliest things that produces. They go straight through into the fall into our frosts and they just produce and produce. One of the things I really struggle with here on the farm is being able to quickly harvest in the flowers and quickly put the bouquets together so that I can maximize the most money out of my time when it comes to the flower sales. And zinnias really do that for me. They are very, very easy to harvest to go in and to pick the flowers out of there. I can do it very quickly. I don't have to fuss with them. They don't fight with me. You know, they're very easy to see what's ready to be picked. And it's also very easy to harvest. I don't have to worry about damaging them. I just go through quick, hack them down, and I have this harvest. And they're also really strong for when I'm arranging. And those big flowers, they just, they put so much into the bouquet. Um, I, I can't say enough about how great the zinnias are. Snapdragons. I swoon over snapdragons. There's so much that I can say about these. They were one of the most prolific stems that I had here on the farm. I grew a couple of different varieties. There are several varieties. And the great thing about snapdragons is that the different varieties have different bloom times. You plant them all at the same time. One will bloom in early or late spring. One will bloom in early summer. One will bloom in late summer. One will bloom in early fall. So you'll have basically a succession planting of snapdragons without even succession planting them. They also come in so many varieties. I could not hold myself back from ordering, I think, 21 varieties for next year. So. This year, I had so many. I think I only put 250 plants in the ground. 250, that's all I did. And I had thousands of stems. And I'll tell you why. So snapdragons, they're one of those cut flowers that you can pinch, and instead of getting one stem, it will shoot outside stems, and you could have up to seven cuttable stems on a snapdragon plant. 
So in terms of profitability, you're only paying a few dollars for a packet of 500 or 1,000, and the germination rate is great, and you put them in the ground, and you just make sure that they're well weeded around, and they get fertilizer, and they are gonna produce for you and keep on producing, cut and come again all day long. Some people are able to overwinter their snaps and put them in the ground in the fall and then they'll get a head start for spring growth. I'm not able to do that because I am a frosty flower farmer in zone 4B, so I have to start them in early spring. But they are hardy, so they will take a frost, I think, down to 22 degrees, a freeze. So you can start them well before your last frost date in the spring if you're in an area like Serena and I are. If you've been around here for any amount of time, you know I am absolutely obsessed with amaranth. Amaranth functions as the backbone of my bouquets. When I go to put together my height of summer bunches, I start with a branch of amaranth and then I just add everything in around it. I find it gives it this structure that I can't get from any other plant or I should say any other plant that is as profitable as it is. Amaranth is so easy to grow. It can be started ahead of time to get an early harvest. You can do it direct from seed. It is not a tricky plant. It's super drought tolerant. It thrives on neglect. This year I overplanted some of my direct seeded amaranth. I never got around to thinning it and it was some of the best amaranth that I've grown. You just can't go wrong with this crop. And the harvesting on it is so fast because I can grow it basically as a single stem. I just go in there and I hack it. It is as quick as the sunflowers, maybe even quicker because I find the leaves strip off a lot easier. Because amaranth basically is, you know, a filler or, you know, something to add texture, it seems like it would be a little bit limited for the amount that I can sell of it because, you know, it needs other flowers to go with it. But I think, I think there's potential there. I think amaranth just on its own can be, you know, a highly desirable plant and it dries so well. I do not lose any of this crop to, you know, missed sales because if I bring it to the market and it doesn't sell for me, I hang it up, it's dry super fast and it holds super well and then it continues on into my dried flower season. So for me, amaranth, I could grow a lot of it before I ran into the point that I couldn't sell it and that is my plan for next year. There's going to be a lot of amaranth showing up on this farm. I cannot make a list of my top cut flowers for 2020 without talking about lilies. So I've always had a patch of lilies no matter where I lived. Um, this, this house right here I had, I've only been in this house for three years, which is my third season growing here. And I had some Susan lilies, those beautiful orange and burgundy ones. I have some red ones and then I had some white eyeliner lilies. Well, I decided that wasn't enough. You know, that wasn't enough for my cut flower farm. So this year I, uh, I dove into Lily Madness and I ordered 750 lilies and I thought, what am I going to do with these? They're, the deer love them, so they needed to be protected from the deer and they're a little bit more on the expensive side. I think I paid $400, I think, for the 750 lilies and they were um, a mixed bag. So I had no idea what I was getting. I mean, I had some idea. The wholesaler has a list of like 20 lilies that they could be, but you know, when you put it in the ground, you don't know what color that is gonna be growing up and it didn't matter. Cause I have to say, without those lilies, I would have had a hard time filling my bouquet CSA orders all summer and fall long. They were fantastic. The colors, it was like a surprise every time I went out to go into the field. Fantastic. Now lilies, you wanna harvest them before they open. You want them to be swollen, the bud to be swollen, but you wanna harvest them before they are open because once they are open, they are very fragile and they will drop petals. If you like touch two together, like boom, 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 they'll fall and you don't wanna do that. It's devastating. I actually had a customer on her way to pick up a custom order and I just set the bouquet on the table and it touched another bouquet and I go, boom, there goes a lily bouquet, like flower, just bing. But, I have to say they're show stoppers and they are a centerpiece in every single bouquet. They're also my most expensive stem that I had in the bou bouquet bar, except for Lysianthus. I had one, one Lysianthus stem that was, that was more expensive than that. But I was able to sell them at the bouquet bar for $4 a stem 
and I was able to sell them to my florists. They were one of the most in-demand flowers from my florist all year long. So I, it was nice that they were able to call and say, hey, Nicole, what do you have for lilies? Do you have white? Do you have pink? Do you have yellow? And I'd be like, got you, and uh, bring her the lilies. So it was fantastic. I do have to say though, it was not my top seller at my bouquet bar, and I think that is because it's well known that lilies are toxic to house cats, and so many people love their cats, it's totally understandable. And I always make sure that I warn people when they're buying something from my property that a lot of these plants, a lot of these flowers are toxic to cats. Now, this is one that might not be on most people's lists, but I love Liatris. Here, with our hot, dry summers, Liatris is very, very easy for me to grow. It's also a perennial, so that means I don't even need to plant it in the spring. It just comes up, and when it first grows, it comes out really, really strong and very quickly turns into this clump that almost looks like grass. And that has a huge advantage because it keeps the weeding down for me. The liatris doesn't take very much work to grow. Some perennials you'd think that they would be, you know, very low labor to grow, but they're not because you need to actually be in there and weeding them because you can't do some of the more aggressive uh, maintaining, you can't till a perennial bed to kill off weeds. So you need to be weeding them. Whereas Liatris, because it comes out and it very quickly shades out the ability of weeds to grow, it makes it very low labor. It also had a really impressive number of weeks that I could keep harvesting off of it. Some perennials, you know, they bloom and you have a couple weeks to get those flowers, but then they're done. But the Liatris, I think I looked back and I counted, I used it in seven weeks of bouquets. That is a huge amount of time to be picking off of the same clump of plants. I love the look of the Liatris too. It is such a unique look. It is, you know, this fuzzy spike. It looks really, really stunning in bouquets and it gives this really great texture. And I also find that it comes on at the point at which my snapdragons are starting to struggle a bit in the heat. So it works perfect because in the spring and early summer I have these snapdragon spikes and basically as they fizzle out I have the liatra spikes to replace them, you know, in my bouquet making recipes. We also dry the liatris here on the farm. So going into future years, my, you know, 50 foot bed of liatris, which produced more, more stems that I could possibly use, is just going to produce more and more. And those I can dry and I can use them all year long. I think for me, the game changer in 2020 for my flower farm and my success in able to bring people to my porch during a pandemic was my gladiolas. I love gladiolas. I've grown them for years, but never to this quantity. This year I invested in 2,500, probably more like 2,800 corms of gladiolas and I succession planted them over the course of about five weeks so that I knew when it come time to harvest them, they would be harvestable for several weeks and not just all come at once. So in terms of profitability, Gladiolas are just, they're not expensive. They're inexpensive. So for 500 corms, and a corm is what you plant into the ground. It's like a bulb, but it's called a corm. It costs $75 through my wholesaler. So for $75, I was able to secure 500 gladiolus corms. And some of those corms actually threw up two stems of gladiolus. So bonus. So when you do the math there, it's $75 for 500 corms. I sold those three for $5 on my bouquet bar and they were always sold out. Several times I had to run like a crazy person over to my gladiola patch and cut more buckets and bring them back to the bouquet bar. I had my husband like, man the fort, I've got to go cut. And I'd run out to the gladiolas patch and refill the buckets. And um, people would come just for the gladiolas, the gladiolas and the sunflowers. People would come buy them for the bunches. And so many people have an emotional connection to those flowers. They'll say, oh my gosh, my grandmother grew these. I love them. They remind me of my grandmother or my aunt always had these out, out front for house. And people have an emotional connection to the flowers. And I think that is um, such a strong part of this entire business. Thank you so much. Of course.
tapping into that emotional connection with people and um, they'll be your customer for a long time. Needless to say, I will never not grow gladiolas. They were amazing. I do want to warn you, gladiolas are um, a target of thrips. Thrips, they're my arch nemesis. So make sure that you uh, stay on top of the bug, the bug control, it's nasty. Thrips, bah. Okay, so for an investment of $75, I was able to bring about $800 back to the farm. So, profitable. Next is Rubecchia. And I have to be honest, I struggled on deciding on this plant. I didn't want to say Cosmos. I use Cosmos all season long in most of my bouquets, but they do not make me any money. They are a lot of work and they don't add a lot of value to bouquets I found. And so I was looking and I was like, what else do I use that's really profitable here on the farm? And I realized that Rubecchia is this, you know, kind of under underappreciated high profit high profit flower here on the farm it's not in my main flower bed i don't pick it every week but i had rubecchia super super early in the season and i didn't just have the bright yellow brown eyed susan rubecchia that's you know kind of hard to use if it was the only thing i had i had brown rubecchias i had bright yellow with green center. I had rich, deep, you know, almost orangey Rubecchias. Probably one of my favorite bouquets of the year that I made was based on Rubecchia and Shasta daisies. Now, there's other things that produced early, and so that is not the reason why Rubecchia gets that, that high up, uh, you know, top 10 spot. It went all season. It didn't stop. And the fact that I had these large Rubecchias or these smaller filler Rubecchias always there, always available for me, just blooming, blooming, growing. It, it's something that I didn't realize is so valuable. They're also really easy to grow. Here for me, most of my patch is perennial. That means it comes back every year and I do need to do some weeding on it. But if I didn't want to have to worry about weeding it every year. I could also plant it in the fall and have it produce all the following year and just rip it out at the end. They, they produce really good in their first year. They don't need to get established. So these are amazing because you can have them as a perennial or you can have them as an annual. Let's talk about gomfrina. So gomfrina is something that I consider to be the workhorse of my flower farm. So I had a 20 foot row of it this year and it just kept producing stems upon stems upon stems. Now Gomfrina is a filler flower. It's got these beautiful pops of color and they are kind of on the small side. They're about the size of a quarter. They come in so many colors. I mostly grew white this year because it goes with everything, but I'm definitely expanding my color palette this next year because I was able to get in some other colors of Gomfrina from a fellow flower farmer of mine, a flower friend, Gina, and at my bouquet bar, they were one of the most talked about items that I had available. Everyone was walking over, like touching them, like going, like, what's this? Like, is this a strawberry? Because <laughs> the red ones really do look like little tiny strawberries, especially when they get those little yellow flowers coming out of them. That, the yellow is actually the bloom on a gomfrina. They really do add so much interest and just texture in your bouquets. And people really love the way that they feel. They have a like a dry texture to them. And speaking of drying, not only do they look fantastic in a fresh bouquet, but you can take those gomfrina, hang them upside down, dry them, and use them all throughout the winter season in wreaths and dried flower arrangements. They're really fantastic multi-purpose flower. And talk about value. You can grow an entire bed of gomfrina for just a few dollars. And the last one is controversial, so I saved it to the end, but weeds. Here on my farm, weeds are very, very profitable for me. You'll notice going through this list, me and Nicole have never mentioned anything that is a filler. And that's because this is a list of profitable flowers. And honestly, 
the fillers and the greenery, they aren't that profitable here on my farm. They take a lot of work to grow. Honestly, they're more difficult than most of the things listed on this list. They aren't necessarily, you know, quick to harvest. A lot of them, you know, take a long season or need to get started as seedlings planted out. They're not simple just simple things. They can take forever to harvest. I know when I go and I pick the basil, it picks very fast, but to actually clean off all the, the leaves off the lower stems, that is a lot of work when I go to make my bouquets. And so because of that, the harvest time isn't that great on them. And finally, they have no value. People, when they look at the bouquets, they just kind of disappear. And so if I was to use lots and lots of filler, I'd be putting lots of lots of labor hours, you know, when you consider what it took to grow and harvest all those, but it wouldn't necessarily all of a sudden transform the bouquet into a two times as much money, three times as much money bouquet in the same way that popping in some of those, you know, high value, uh, really, really punchy focal flowers do but you still need to have it. You need to have those pieces to be able to put together the entire bouquet piece. And that is where weeds come in. The thing that is so great about weeds is you don't need to put in the labor to grow it. You don't need to put in the labor to take care of it. You don't have any you know, initial investment. The only cost to the weeds are your labor for harvesting. So here on the farm, I sold a ton of money in catnip early in the spring. I had catnip flowering and beautiful. It was a filler, you know, it added, added all this texture, it added all this fun when I had nothing else. And that was a hundred percent of weed. It was, you know, on the back corner of my property. I didn't even know it was there. And I hacked on that hedge for, you know, a good six weeks. And even now I'm using some of it dried in my dried arrangements. Amaranth the wild weed amaranth, you know, the big weed the thing farmers really don't want in their hay fields. I love it. It looks beautiful and it's ready way, way earlier than the cultivated amaranths. It, in fact, I've been looking to try to find a cultivated amaranth that gives me that same look of the pigweed and I just can't find it. So I guess it means I'm going to be continuing to allow a little bit of it to seed, you know, this nasty weed to grow on my property because I love it so much in the late spring. A few other things I use this year that aren't necessarily weeds, but also has that same value that a weed has is I was picking things out of my vegetable farm that were past their prime, you know, the gone to flower. Cilantro is a perfect example of this. I couldn't sell it as a vegetable anymore, but now that it had these flowers, it was perfect. It was perfect as a filler flower. So there was lots of these things that I would have, you know, been pulling out and throwing in the compost that instead I could pull out, I could bring into my flower studio and I could use and I could get some money out of them. So I definitely encourage you guys to think a little bit creatively when you go to put together, you know, the list of the most profitable things that will be for you to grow or, you know, the most productive things to be in your home cutting gardens. There's some of these things that maybe you don't think of them as being highly valuable until you realize that you can use them for such low cost. Thank you so much for joining us. I love absolutely every flower on this list, both mine and Nicole's. In fact, hearing Nicole talk over and over again throughout this growing season about how great Glad's have been for her. She's convinced me, she suckered me into buying them, and I now have 500 Glad's coming for my garden for 2021. So there was things that I definitely learned this year uh, from this list that I'm gonna be using into the future years. And please make sure to go check out Nicole's channel. Thanks so much for including me in this video. I had such a good time. I love sharing what I learn through this growth process on my own flower farm. I have tons of videos over on my page, Flower Hill Farm. Check it out if you wanna watch me fail and watch me succeed, I put it all out there. I always say I do not consider myself an expert. I consider myself a learner. I am always learning and sharing what I learn. And that's just what I like to do. I'm kind of a, um, I don't know, no shame. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how I'm failing. Here's how I'm succeeding. Here are my, my kids, here are my chickens. And, and my husband helps me out. His name is actually Brad Pitt. <laughs> There's like a big joke in my videos. Where's Brad Pitt? Brad Pitt. <laughs>
His name's actually Brad Pitt, his legal name. Um, he's not the Hollywood one, but I think he's better looking. So anyway, thank you guys so much for uh, letting me be part of this video. We'll see you soon.